Right, so it says that the webinar is now streaming live on YouTube. Um, the recording here, though, is paused. Can, we, can it be started on um, resume recording? Fantastic, so we are now recording. So at 18.07, and um, very excited to welcome you all to our CAMDOC UK webinar, our 14th CAMDOC UK webinar, talking with the community. Today, we are focusing on men's health, and in particular, we are focusing on matters of the mind. Now, I've had a few messages saying, is it only men who have problems with their mind? Is it only men who have problems with their health? And the answer is no. We've had lots of webinars um, by CAMDOC UK focusing on COVID, nutrition, and the last series was on women's health. We were talking about menopause, and so it's now the turn of our men. And you can check up on all our previous webinars on our YouTube channel, uh, where we would love you to subscribe, like, and share all of our previous recordings. So welcome, my name is Dr. Montia Morgan and I am a founder member of CAMDOC UK. I am currently serving as the membership secretary of our esteemed organization. My day job is as um, a consultant ENT surgeon. Uh, however, I am absolutely passionate about matters to do with the mind and how it works. And what a lot of people don't know is that I also hold a certificate in um, counseling and psychotherapy, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, from the point of view of housekeeping, uh, you will be finding that somewhere along the line, we have an amazing team behind the scenes, uh, including our chairperson, Dr. Bello, our uh, education secretary, uh, Dr. Valentine Gua, and um, our social secretary, Dr. Anam Bene, who will be putting up a, mat uh, a survey right at the beginning somewhere and somewhere towards the end as well. So as you'll be uh, aware, we are recording this. And so uh, I hope that we have your consent for recording. Specifically to do with questions and answers, although the chat box is open and you would have seen some messages coming through there, we would quite like you to put your questions to us through the question and answer box right at the bottom. And then we can strive to answer these questions at uh, either live or behind the scenes. So let's get down to the nitty gritty about mind over matter. Today we're talking about men's health and in to be specific, men's mental health. This year, uh, we've just recently had Mental Health Awareness Week, which was between the 9th to the 15th of May. And the theme was loneliness. We all know that loneliness does not mean you're alone. You can be full of a, in, a, in a house full of people and in a room full, full of friends, but still lonely. Let's look at some statistics, shall we? In the UK, one in eight men has a common mental health ailment, such as anxiety or depression. Three times as many men as women die by suicide. That is staggering. Out of every four people, you'll find that three of them will be men who complete their lives, who end their lives by suicide. Men between the ages of 40 to 49 years have the highest rate of suicide. These are big, big, statistics. These are serious matters. And in particular, men report lower levels of life satisfaction. They find that the juice of their life is lost. And this is from the Government National Wellbeing Survey here in the UK. Compared to women, men report lower levels of really enjoying their life. And we also know 
that men are less likely to access psychological therapies than women. Only one out of three, so 36% of referrals to NHS talking therapies are for men. So there's no doubt about it. There is definitely a stigma attached to mental health problems. If you tell your friend, oh, I've got diabetes or I broke my leg, it's just like, okay, well, I'm really sorry to hear this. But you won't go and tell your friend that you can't sleep at night and you are waking up in the morning feeling uh, as though the world is actually ending and so you feel you're just desperately sad all the time. So people don't talk about this. And among our black men, our African men, there are various reasons that makes this even worse. There is a culture of being strong. You would have heard uh, as you were growing up, men don't cry, come on, man up, grow a pair, those sort of things. There is also a taboo about mental health problems and people tend to think that it's to do with maybe juju or other sort of um, esoteric reasons behind uh, why they have mental health problems. And on top of that, in this environment where we are, where we are supposed to be a minority or we, we present as a minority, we find that we are at the receiving end of daily insults, microaggressions, which make us have an extra layer of stress. I won't, um, I won't bite around, beat around the bush. There are certainly issues to do with health inequalities and uh, to do with racism and how people um, actually live their lives. So this is a very important subject and it is my pleasure to invite our guests, our, our learned guests to talk to us about matters of the mind relating to men's mental health. We have three speakers, and I'll give you a, a very short introduction to each, but before they give you their talks, I'll tell you more about them. Dr. Stuart Ngassa will be our first speaker, and he will give us a general rundown about the clinical aspects to do with depression in midlife uh, for men. And there we are, there's that poll, uh, I was telling you about, if you could just go ahead and, and answer the poll, that would be fantastic. Our sec second speaker is Mr. Bansita Maimo, and he's going to talk to us about how to let go of the shadow and take control of the inner man. And finally, Mr. Tabiabai is going to give us an idea of how um, the everyday man deals with keeping mentally fit. So without further ado, um, I will invite Dr. Ngassa to give us a 10 minute talk, followed, followed by, by, at which time we will be able to ask some questions um, on um, depression in midlife for men. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you can see my screen. You can see. Oh, okay. 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 Yes, you can. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'll just dive straight into it. Uh, the, sorry. So uh, I won't go into all of these statistics because uh, Dr. Moncho has already given us uh, most of the statistics. The only thing that I might want to mention is the fact that uh, when men actually uh, visit their physicians uh, during consultations, they're very likely, they're less likely to ask questions about their health conditions, or they ask very fewer questions compared to their female counterparts. So uh, depression. The first thing I want to make us understand is the fact that depression is not just a temporal change in your mood or a sign of weakness. Uh, also, there's one thing that in our culture, when people 
talk about mental health or, or, or things like that, that look upon as a weak man, or uh, it's more attributed to witchcraft and other things. But I want us to understand that it is a real medical condition, which consists of emotional, physical, and uh, thought uh, symptoms. So depression is actually a mood disorder that involves persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. Uh, the, most of these stats have already been mentioned by our previous speaker. So what causes depression? Depression is usually caused by interplay between biology, psychology, and our social environment. Biological factors could include things like deficiency in some of the brain chemicals, like the happy uh, chemicals in the brain. It could be due to psychological factors, which include things like poor thinking patterns. So there are some people who always think negative about everything, and at times this can make them to become depressed. Social factors could include loss. It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be a loss of the job. It could be difficult life events, such as rape, or a sense of failure. Stress and abusive relationship can also contribute to someone having depression. So what are the signs and symptoms of depression? Emotional symptoms will include low mood, loss of interest. So suddenly someone in the family who has always loved to do something suddenly doesn't want to do that anymore. They think they're worthless and they have a strong feeling of guilt. Some of them get to the extent that they start having uh, suicidal thoughts. Physical symptoms will include sleep difficulties, uh, lack of appetite, general lack of energy. It could also come as some form of agitation. So the person becomes quite uh, chaotic in the life or they become very slow in everything that they do. Other symptoms might include uh, concentration and memory difficulties. So how is depression different in men? So men can experience dep depression differently from women and they're more likely to deny, hide or mask their feelings. So they might mask their feelings by becoming very aggressive at home or some of them might even just run away from home. Women are more likely to discuss their feelings with their peers or even with other family relatives, but because we have this feeling that a man is a strong person that's supposed to absorb everything that comes to them without uh, showing any emotions. So at the end of the day, we suffer with physical pain, they become irritable, and they can involve in reckless behavior like drinking and using drugs just to uh, cope with the symptoms. So women use food and friends to self-medicate, while men will tend to spots or drugs. And so now that we've been able to identify the symptoms and signs of depression, how do we treat depression? Usually the first step for depression is more about taking some lifestyle changes and which have been shown to be very effective. So if you eat healthy, get good sleep, and you exercise regularly, try to reduce a sleep level, that itself can actually help to bring down the level of depression. Now, if that's not helpful enough for people who come in with mild de uh, depression, we can give them some kind of self-guided help. This will also involve some of the lifestyle changes that was mentioned above or we can refer them for some kind of talking therapy. People who have moderate to severe depression, we can combine talking therapy with uh, antidepressant medications. So remember the happy chemical in the brain that talks about. So the antidepressant just helps to replenish these chemicals that are lacking. When people come in with life-threatening depression, what we can do is we can send some electric signals to target certain areas of the brain and that itself can help to increase some of the chemicals that we're talking about and can help to cure the depression. So I would like to summarize by saying that uh, 
depression is something that's very common. It is a medical condition. We shouldn't associate it to witchcraft and other sort of things. It is real. And men can actually have symptoms that are different from symptoms in women. You should suspect depression when there is a sudden change in someone's behavior and there are treatment out there. So you shouldn't suffer in silence. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Gasta. That was such a clear presentation, um, uh, giving us a background of, uh, of what depression actually is, because there is the general tendency, because it is a behavioral presentation. People just say, oh, I'm sad, I'm depressed. And so they just feel that depression is just being sadness. I've seen somewhere where it was described as depression is malignant silence. And when you're talking about malignancy, you're talking about something that is insidious, that you can't do anything about it. Malignancy is a cancer. And Lewis Walpert actually described depression as a black cloud that comes over a person that they can't do anything about. And so having this difference um, from a, a sadness or a reaction to something that's happened, your wife has left you and you're sad, or you're, you could be depressed as in, as in having a re reactive depression, or Manchester United, I can see that you're a supporter of Arsenal, I can imagine that you would be depressed all the time at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> Almost all the time. <laughs> Almost all the time. <laughs> So, Absolutely. So, so that's, that, that is a clear difference. I must apologize actually to our audience because um, I didn't actually present, give, give an introduction, a proper introduction of uh, Dr. Ngassa. Um, Dr. Ngassa is a physician and a public health expert, as well as a resident in psychiatry in the Northwest Deanery, Manchester. What that means is that he is going through the process of becoming a consultant psychiatrist. He trained as a doctor at the University of Oya Medical School and worked in Cameroon as a GP for many years. And then he won the prestigious Chevening Scholarship and did his <coughs> MSc at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine before taking up his, present, his, his, um, his specialization as a psychiatrist. So um, the, the, we have a question in the question and uh, Q&A box there, and it comes from an anonymous attendee. And it says, how can you help your spouse or your brother who is depressed but doesn't want to seek help? That is an amazing, really, really good question. So Dr. Ngassa, would you be able to feel that one for us? I think that's something that is very common. Um, the first thing is they usually deny the fact that they're not depressed. Um, so the first step is recognizing the fact that they have some symptoms of depression. And I think for any person who is an adult, the best thing you can do is to give them that education that they can actually get help. There is help out there. The, the difficulty that some people have is going to a mental institution, they don't want to be leveled as having a mental health condition. But today with technology, you can have access to treatment from wherever you want to. So there are various online services that you can subscribe to. And at the confine of your room or at work, you can just have some kind of uh, assessment by a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and you can actually get the help. So educate them, let them understand that they can have help and they don't need to present themselves to a mental health institution and they can get some kind of support. Fantastic, that, that's a really um, good, good answer to that. And, and as, a, as also with digital technologies that we have in these, these days, there, has, there are a lot of apps which are um, connected to supporting people uh, uh, mentally. And uh, yes, of course, um, Mr. Maimo wanted to add something to the answer. I think we may come to that after you've given your presentation, which I'll go straight forward onto, on, onto now. Thank you, Dr. Ngasta. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Bansika Maimo.
Now then, Mr. Uh, Bansika Maimo, or as he's commonly known as Coach BK, is the force behind Mindset Boulevard, which is uh, the strap line is the mind, your gold mine. He was formally trained in biological sciences and IT, and from then he developed a very keen interest and a passion into tapping into the, uh, into the inner self. Coach BK will talk to us about letting go of the shadow. So we're talking about you as a human being being reduced to a shadow and taking control of the inner man. I'll hand over right now to Coach BK. Thank you. Can I just check that you can hear me? Yes. Oh, all right. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Let's see if I can switch to slide. Is my screen visible? Perfect. It's all good? Yes, all good. Okay. Can we go to the first slide? Linda, are you in, are you the one running? Are you the one controlling the slides, or am I the one just? No, I am. You are. Um, could you let me take control for a oh. second? Okay, let me stop sharing. Sorry about that. I should let you. My apologies. Okay, can you see my screen? We can see you, but not your screen. So while you're setting up your screen, uh, I might just ask Dr. Ngassa to, and, and just let me know when you, you've got your screen up. Sure. Um, can I just ask Dr. Ngasa, there's a question in the, in the Q&A box. Are there any online tools to help diagnose depression? So I think Dr. Ngasa is still on mute. Yes. Oh, lovely. Here we go. So, Mr. Bank, fabulous. Thank you very much. We can see your screen now. Okay. Sorry, can I just ask Mr. Bai if you can put yourself on mute? Oh, sorry. All right. So sorry about that. Okay, so let's get started. We will be looking at midlife, so mental health, obviously, from a purely conceptual perspective. I like us to journey through the onset of life, midlife. We we'll look at mind and meaning potential pitfalls and landmines, how we potentially can navigate and circumvent hazardous thinking patterns. It is in Now, how did that feel? I'm sure you'd agree with me that that felt uncomfortable.
Oh, Are you having trouble with your presentation? Yes, I'm, having, I'm having trouble. If we could just move on. I need to wake up. Shall we fall back to Dr. Bello? If you if you stop sharing your screen, Mr. Maimo. Okay. Yeah. Can you stop sharing your screen and then um, uh, Linda can share hers. She yeah, can share the, the presentation. Just, yeah, just uh, it's just completely frozen. <laughs> yeah. So bear with me a minute, please. We are having a few technical issues. Um, here we are. So we've got Linda, uh, Dr. Bello, and she's got the, the, the slides up. Right then, okay. we can go right. That's it, that's where we were. So Linda, can we go back to the first slide? Okay. Okay. So like I said before, as, I said, as we said at the beginning, we'll journey through life, midlife, mind and meaning, potential pitfalls, landmines, and navigation and circumvention of hazard thoughts, hazardous thought patterns. Let's go to the next slide, please. Mind, molders of meaning, molders of meaning. So, We can't seem to hear Mr. Mimo. Is it just me? No audio, no audio. There's no audio. Can you hear? I think we've probably run into some uh, serious technical issues um, because we can't see Coach BK and neither can we hear him. Um, so if probably the best thing would be for you to um, drop, drop the, the slides, Linda, please. Fantastic. And uh, what we'll do is, and I could see that there's in the chat, there is a, a, hef, a, a real brisk discussion about where um, patients are being referred to talking therapies. Um, and uh, there is Michael who is saying that access to the online talking therapies is notoriously poor in the UK on account of years of untold under, in, under investment, which um, our chairperson, who is a GP, disagrees with. Unfortunately, um, I will have to side with, the, with Michael because it is quite well known that although we have um, access to online therapies that NHS one out of I think it's only about four million people are referred to talking therapies and only or, or six million people are referring to talking therapies and only about two million do actually access it so one in three 
are not able to, to access it. But we'll come back to this um, in a short while. It might just be that we have to get Dr. Bello uh, step in because uh, Coach BK seems to have dropped out. In the meantime, what we will do is um, go forward and pick up. Um, oh, there we have we have Mr. Mimo. Have we got you on? I hope so. I haven't got a clue what is happening at this end. Okay, let us so let us try that again. So shall we leave the slides or shall we just go ahead and give your presentation without the slides? Because it seems like they might have some gremlins. Uh, yes. Oh, gosh. Let's see. How do we do this? Um, OK. We can see you and we can hear you perfectly. You can see me and you can hear me. Perfectly. Right. So just go for it. Just still need to bring up the presentation itself. Just give me a second, please. All right. Yes, I guess we can forget about the presentation and just yes, just go for it. Yes. That work? Yes. Okay. Can everyone see me and hear yes, me? Yes, we can hear now you and we can see yep. you. Okay. So I guess this is a classical example of the things that we go through life sometimes. You come prepared, you know that you've got all your ducks in a row and everything falls apart. I'm sure you would agree with me this is a reason and a good excuse for anyone to lose their marbles. Why? Because the entire world is watching. So where do you start? Do you fold? Do you pick yourself up? Do you run? Do you hide? Because this is reality and this is as real as it gets. We make plans and they go in different directions. So to you out there, what I would love to say is, if you go through this, it's not the end of the world. Can I just check that you can still hear me? Going through, yes, going through this is just the beginning of life. It is not the end of the world. As a child, when you fall, you wake up, you pick, you pick the pieces, you pull yourself up by the bootstraps, and then you pick up where you left out, and you grow your life from that point going forward. You know, it's like they say, you come to meet life. We will come to the presentation, but I just want to seize this opportunity based on what just happened and have a conversation with you, connect with you who have been through this place. You've experienced this before, you have lived it, you know how it feels. How do you deal with it? You know, life is not about the number of years that you put in living, it is the quality of the years that you spend living. As soon as we get that, come to that realization, life starts when we decide that we will be. And it's always, there is always an opportunity for a new beginning. Sorry about that, that was my phone. It's all going wrong today, as you can see. But we, have to, we have to keep going. And this is what life is all about. You should be able to laugh at yourself. So. It's good. It's just some background. I just, I'm just waiting for the background to cool off and to see the light. Yeah, please be muted. Okay. So it's all about midlife. And we said we were going to journey through midlife, didn't we? The pitfalls, some of the hazardous thought patterns that we entertain and ways of circumnavigating them to a place of life and living. Words as models of meaning. I will need those slides to guide me. Um, Linda, please bring the slides up. I don't think anything should go wrong this time round. Just bring the slides up because there are certain points I do not want to miss for the purpose of our audiences. Can Linda hear me? Brilliant. So 
words as or words as morals of meaning. What are words? We want to be very careful with the words that we use because these words are the building blocks. So our words and choice of expressions reflect. And I'd like to say this again. Our choice of words and expressions reflect our state and frame of mind at any point in time. Now, these become the building blocks of the script that downstream translates into our reality. But then what is reality? The outward manifestation of our internal representations. Let's put that into perspective, shall we? I give you these three words, problem, challenge, and opportunity. Take it from them. I invite you to digest each of these words. Mind them for me. Meditate on them. What is the emotion that each word evokes? What is the feeling that each emotion provokes? Now, what are the sentiments and sensations that are associated with these feelings? Now, if you look at each of these words, you realize they are all alive and each one carries its own vibe. So in life, if we find perspective, we find self, we find meaning, and we can run with life. If that's still Ripley Hazen, let me present to you Kizito. Next slide, please. Linda, next slide, please. I present to you Kizito functioning. Linda, are you have any trouble? Yep, yeah, just a minute. Sure. Okay. Now, this is Kizito functioning. A brother from another mother, he's based in the US. Kizito recently completed a marathon in the UK, many thousand miles from his home. He did it in style, in the African traditional regalia, the Togo. Now, as I remember my brother way back in school, he would not run to save his life if you were called upon to do so, and that would be the last thing you were asked to do. In fact, on a pitch, on a football pitch, you couldn't tell the difference between my brother and the ball because they were both round and equally tall. But look at him today. Kizito is the junction where perfection and dedication clash. So we notice that once upon a time, Kizito took what was a problem, added meaning and value to it, and it became a challenge. He didn't have to do it, he chose to do it because of the meaning and the value that he assigned to it and the fulfillment that he eventually got out of it. He then would take that challenge, infuse it with purpose. Life is all about living purposefully. He infused it with purpose, built a vision around it, gave it a mission, and that became a vocation, different from his profession. We will talk about this a bit later, a bit more later. And this since has become an opportunity of a lifetime because Kizito supports charitable causes the world over. And that is just supreme. Now let's look at Cam Dark. By the same token, heartless as the, well, heartful, as the selfless as they are, they are serving their community. And as far as I'm aware, there is no financial remuneration attached or affiliated to this gig. But I know that they get remuneration in a different currency. And this currency is fulfillment. What is fulfillment? It is the joy you receive when you give, not because you want to get, but because you have come to a head and a space, a head space and a place where you understand that giving can be its own reward, especially when you're serving a purpose that is bigger than yourself. So how do we say thank you to these people? Next slide, please. 
And as we can see, when we change the way we look at things, the things that we look at begin to change. Nothing really has meaning until we give it and adorn it meaning. Having trouble in there? Yes, I'm just going to reshare it because it kept on uh, pausing. No While you're doing that, I'll just see if I can carry on. Uh, I'll just carry on in the interest of time, if that is okay. So we said nothing really has meaning until we give it meaning. And the way we relate and associate and embrace life is a direct function of our frame and state of mind. And so we take this frame and state of mind into midlife, the onset of midlife. Notice at this stage, nothing is really different. We've been living all along. We have different priorities. We're going in different directions. We're looking to impress A, B, C, and D. And we come to a place where these things do not fulfill, any, fulfill us anymore. We're looking for new meaning. We're looking for guidance and direction. We want something. That is not about impressing the world, something that's about making a difference. So we stop, we take stock, and we assess ourselves. The self-assessment is based on what? Our self-imposed expectations, the expectations of our friends and family, those who are around us, who make and break us, and of course, the pressures that society bestows upon us. Telling us who we should be, where we should live, how we should talk and walk, who we need to rub shoulders with in order to become somebody. But it's because I have seen families break under the weight of this pressure. And this needs to stop. We need to be able to take our lives in our hands and give it meaning. And do what you've got a passion for. So we take our successes and our perceived failures, our do's and our don'ts, our hits and our misses. We run them through this filter at the end of which we pull out what I call the self-fulfillment index. Now, this self-fulfillment index is just a measure of how fulfilled and content or joyful we are in life. It means nothing until we give it meaning. And so we take this into, based on how we resonate with it, the resonance that comes of it and how we feel about it, we take it into, next slide, Linda, please, what I then call or refer to as the circle of life's cycle inner communication. Now, what is this? This cycle is the think, feel, act cycle. That is where life happens. It all starts in the mind and it irradiates and it moves outward into reality. It translates into reality. Remember what we said in the onset? The words and expressions that we use create our reality. And that reality is the outward manifestation of our internal representations. This cycle takes three variables. It takes, first of all, the roles that we play in life. We're different things to different people, for different intents, at different times, for different intents and purposes, and to different ends. Then it takes our needs and how we meet them while we fulfill these roles, so to speak. And finally, it takes our wants how we indulge in them and how we oblige to them. It's important to highlight at this point that when we confuse or conflict our needs for our wants, that is a recipe for disaster. Let's look at the thinking machine because that's where it all happens. Every thought, we are going to explain what, a thought, what the thought process is because it carries it carries the juice of life. If we think right, we will feel right. If we feel right, then our actions will take their rise, rise from those feelings. So let's see how that actually happens. Every thought generates an impulse, which is a thought field. This thought field sets the cause in motion. When I say, I love you, you pick up an impulse and translate into something in you. When I say, I love you, it's a, different, different, it's a completely different emotion and a completely different feeling that comes with it. So we should watch what we put out there. Now, every wave or every thought wave has got a frequency and a wavelength. Akin to tuning into a radio station or a TV station. 
When you tune into CNN, you get CNN. You can't tune into CNN and get BBC any more than you can tune into BBC and get CRTV. So what you tune into, the vibe you put out, the energy you put out is what you will attract and it's what you beget. You put out love, you get love. You put out fear, you get fear. You put out hate, you get fear. You have hate. So it's important for us to bear that in mind. We will attract who we are. We don't see the world the way it is. We see the world as we are. So it's important that we think right. Then the feelings. I wanted us to talk about thought quadrants and how they work, but in the interest of time, we'll drop that for now because a lot has gone wrong. Let's look at feelings. There are low level feelings. So again, we know that our feelings take their rise from our thoughts, the quality of our thoughts, the quality of our feelings will determine those feelings. There are low level feelings, and we're happy, we're sad, we're we feel good, we feel bad, we feel fear. That is the most dangerous of all feelings. Then there are high level feelings, fulfillment, contentment, and joy. They come from the inside out. Nothing needs to be happening around you for you, for you to be in that state and frame of mind. It's just a state, it's just you being you, in a place of being you're inspired to do. And then we look at the oracle, I call it the holy grail of all feelings. And this is the feeling of vulnerability, because this is where it all happens. Can you be vulnerable is the question that I asked. And I invite you to ask that question right now. Can you look at someone that you care for? Not expect love to be reciprocated and say, I love you. Because that is who you are. You are a light. Is that possible? If you can't, why? Can you look at someone and say, hey, look, um, Mo, I'm sorry. I offended you. I won't do it again. Forgive me. That is being born. Can you say, um, Uncle Tabby, Julian, come on, Julian, smile for me, please. You're looking too serious. You're scaring me. That's better. Uncle Tabby, um, I don't know this. Please teach me. Show me how to do this. Can you do that? See, because if you can do that, you find yourself in a resourceful state and in that state or from that state, you can be anything at any time because you attract people. People want to feel needed. And so if you've got a need, people just can't wait to meet and greet you at your point of need. But if you can't be vulnerable, you can't be anything. Let's look at what happens when you can't be vulnerable. Any situation that you find yourself in, that puts you in a state and a free mind of vulnerability translates into an insecurity. That is the thing that would make you quarrel about the toilet seat that is up when really what you're trying to say to your spouse is, I don't get your attention. I don't think you feel me. I don't feel understood to talk to. And it is a dangerous cycle because we then go down the perilous path, that rabbit hole. And we become a shadow of ourselves, ultimately. Next slide, please. I've skipped so much. There's so much to say. There's so little time in which to say it. I can only ask that you forgive. Now, again, life means absolutely nothing until we give it meaning. And living is a full-time job. It has got purpose and what is the purpose it's for you and i to complete the process of creation that started many million years ago what are the prerequisites we go through life we talked about the different roles why do we pick on these roles these roles will challenge us they will push us to the brim based on our circumstances and our experiences we will get to understand who we are what we are good at we get to meet and greet our gifts our talents our potentials and our capabilities our poten I'll say that again. We get to meet our gifts, our talents, our abilities, and our capabilities, and we leverage them. It is important to understand that when we can do that, we become the tool that we were designed to be. We don't end up being a hammer trying to be a nail, or a nail trying to be a hammer. That's about finding identity. Whether you are a parent, a spouse, a child, a sister, there are teachers in there and they bring 
lessons? Can we go in and mind the situation for the lesson, learn, grow, become bigger? You see, because when we do that, when we live a life of purpose, because we've found something that we do and we're good at, life is fulfilling and brings us to a place where we do not circle through the cycle of life. We cycle through the circle of life. What's the difference? When we circle through the cycle of life, we are. Next slide, please. I think okay, we lost this slide. That's fine. We can stay with the previous one. Linda, Linda, please. Thank you. We can stay with the previous one. Yeah, so when we, when we cycle through the circle of life, which each, with each iteration through the thing, feel, act cycle, we get to discover self. We define, redefine. We refine and streamline who we are. So we're becoming bigger and better and finding more opportunities to make a difference. And that is why I do coaching because it is not something that I do. It is who I am, very akin to IT. Because in IT, as Uncle Ebai will tell us all shortly, I'm actually in the data provisioning space, on-prem and, and cloud. So you notice that you're dealing with different systems and components that interact in isolation, in unison, and then they interact with other components for a desired outcome. When there is coherence across the board, you build synergies. You exchange those energies and you build synergies. It's no different from life. So I take that, I use it here. I take this, I use it there. And life just has meaning. Fantastic. Sorry, can I just say, um, can we round up Coach BK, please? Yes. Sorry about time. that. <laughs> so yes. sorry about that. Yeah, so um, rounding up, we want to circle or cycle through the circle of life, not circle through the cycle of life, because life becomes mundane, boring, monotonous, and we become a shadow of ourselves. I'd like to end with this quote where we see a wall, God usually sees a door. Thank you, and sorry again. Fantastic, thank you, thank you ever so much. Thank you ever so much. I, I, I was mesmerized uh, when we did get going, the, the thought, the, you know, the energy behind that, um, the whole concept of your thoughts become things, what you put out, you get, the law of attraction, all of those. Can we get, um, Linda, can you stop sharing the screen, please? Yeah, so absolutely mesmerizing. Um, just going from there and uh, knowing that our, the, the general um, black man is strong. He doesn't do all this fluffy, touchy-feely stuff. How do you actually get our community to understand that this is a physical notion, the think, feel, act cycle is something that is necessary for us to tap into and to move with in order to get ourselves out of that shadow into our real selves. How do we encourage ourselves to tap into that vulnerable space that you were talking about? Thank you. That is an amazing question. Thank you for asking it. When you look at the world today, there is one thing that is tottering on the verge of senile decay, and it is friendship. 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 If you can find one friend. You see, because having a friend is like having a place and a space where you can be yourself, where you will be loved and not be judged. And very few people have that, especially because we live other people's lives. We're living to look good for others. Then there are ex expectations that have been bestowed upon us. And because we think we owe these people their debt, we have to live to fulfill their dream. And we do that at our expense and at the expense of the greater good. The family. If we do not understand that the family is where society starts, as small as unit of society, and if we don't get that right, then the war that I read, is fighting against the US, for instance, is the product of a broken home that has rippled into this into somebody who's 
who is miserable and in a position of power that can take decisions that enable them to pull triggers. So to answer your question, to answer your question, uh, it's, it, it is simple. If we have sustainable relationships, if you can find a single friend with whom you can be yourself, truly be vulnerable, they will show you by virtue of your interactions, they make you comfortable to find and be yourself. And from that place, you can do just about anything because the fear fizzles out. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that really all-encompassing question, which in itself brings out different things that we can talk about later um, um, to do with encouraging people, going back to the topic that Michael was talking about, the self-help and, the, and the, the talking therapy space, encouraging people, if they don't have that friend, to get um, access to, it may be, it may seem to be a little bit artificial, but having that space where you can tap into fills the need that you're, between, you're talking about having a friend with whom um, with whom you can share your, your, your issues. So let's move on from there, I'd, I'd like you to. And as I say, I would encourage anybody who has any questions to put them in the question and answer box so that we can come up, come back to them, please. And I'd like to move on to our third speaker. Now, um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Mr. Julian Tabi Ibai to our CAMDOC UK uh, webinar. Uh, Mr. Ibai is a special guest today because he's in fact married to a doctor. So that makes him special. Um, he is a pillar of the Cameroonian community in the UK. And he is in his day job, he is the managing director of Jetplay Consulting, which for the past 25 years has advised an impressive portfolio of high profile clients uh, in, the, in the space of enterprise resource planning, business re-engineering, Oracle, and lots of things that I don't even understand. Um, he is very, very actively involved with NGOs as well as professional and community diaspora groups. He is on uh, the board, he's a trustee on the board of EXA UK, Voice of the Child UK, to name a few. He was actually trained, um, he did his first degree in economics and accounting and then went on to train as a lawyer. He's not a liar, he tells the truth. And so it is really my privilege to invite Mr. Julian Ebai, a lot of people call him Tableau, uh, to talk to us about the everyday approach to keeping mentally fit as a midlife man, a man in his midlife. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Monty, for that very kind introduction. I want to seize this opportunity to thank CAMDOC for inviting me to this very August group. I want to thank the organizers and I also special thanks to Dr. Ngasa for starting her off on this very lovely journey. And of course for BK, I think Africans uh, hardly talk to life coaches, but it's something I will highly recommend. I have to start by saying that I'm saying this from an everyday perspective of what we deem to be uh, mental well-being, mental health, and I'm going to use my own personal example. And I'm going to start this. I think the pertinent topic is to increase the awareness and openness about mental well being. But I'm just going to give two quotes. Between 2008 and 2018, prescriptions for antidepressant medication in the UK increased from 36 million to 70.9 million. Very, very high. Antidepressants are used to treat many disorders, including depression. I'm going to speak specifically about depression because I know we have more qualified people here to talk about all the different mental uh, things you can have. I came to this country at 15. I'm now 55. Uh, I've been here now for 39 years, so I fall into the category of a middle age, and we do have problems for sure as an African. But the older you get, the more problems you have. And I put it very simple, the older you get, you're gonna lose loved ones like your dad, your mom, you might lose a spouse, you might lose a child, you might think about your background, whether you come from a rich or poor background is irrelevant. As a child, you just need a good home. 
if you're mistreated as a child, it might surface when you're middle age. You think about all the tough times you had. If you did fantastic in school, you might get what I call superiority complex, where everything has to be good. You get to middle age, it's not happening. If you didn't do too well in school, suddenly at middle age, you're doing fantastic, you get cocky. As you get older as well, you lose uh, friends, you lose relationships, you break up, you get divorced. Uh, your, your kids leave home. Some kids leave home and don't call you anymore. You get to jobs, uh, people are retraining, you have the young guns taking the same jobs that you have. You have younger people who become your boss. As an African man, we always assume that age is wisdom, age is leadership, age is the boss. Not in the Western world. Age is just a number. If you don't deliver, you're no longer relevant. So as you get to middle age, you become less relevant. The way you look physically, the way you dress. Like for me, I used to have beautiful hair. I've lost my hair. For some people, they worry them. I get them depressed. But actually, bald hair for some women, they find it very, very interesting. So you always have to spin. And when I say spin, you must redefine yourself. As you get older, look for new interests. When I say new interests, it's because uh, women in our communities, they get better as they get older. They take better care of themselves. They eat better. They drink less. They don't spend money on things you should not spend money. There's no attraction out there to go impress your friends about uh, the number of women you can go out with or the house bills you could pay. They don't have that stress. Men have that stress. Women are competitive when it comes to making sure their kids do the best. Men look at things that sometimes is not important. It's vanity. Big house, big car, big holidays. All of those things lead to the things that cause us stress. Mental anxiety that you can't meet up to your requirements. We eat so much food, we put on so much weight, we start having heart problems, cholesterol, diabetes. All of those things potentially could lead to what I would say, depression. Issues of not meeting up to your family requirements. It's very easy to receive, very difficult to give. Middle-aged African men grow up to give, they give all the time to the sacrifice of themselves, not only to their wives, to their kids, to their immediate families, their siblings, their moms, their dads, whatever. There comes a time when you must take care of yourself. If you don't love yourself, you cannot love anybody else. So my humble advice to middle-aged men from what I see is that we have a lot of problems because we don't talk to anybody. And there's a word that uh, BK use. I think a friend in need is a friend indeed. You don't need many friends. You need many acquaintances, but you need few real friends. And friendship is about brotherhood, comradeship, unconditional, unequivocal, no judgment. But that's not what we have in our community. The day you lose a job, not many friends. They take you off the Njangi because you can't pay. The day you lose a job, not many friends will come to your house because there's nothing to offer. There's no brandy. There's no whiskey. The day you lose a job, there's nothing to talk about, to boast about. Whereas the day you lose a job, you lose opportunity. Those are the days your friends should come and support you, whether to retrain, whether to advise you about courses, whether to support you. The middle-aged African man doesn't have it. He's in competition with himself, and that alone is a problem. And they talk about mental well-being. If you go to any business in the world now, mental well-being is a big thing. I mean, I put systems for major companies in the world, WHO, Virgin Media, Maryland, you name it. Well-being is the best thing because the longer the number of people are off work for being sick, productivity goes down. So the make sure well-being is fantastic. You have people talking about how is your health? How was the weather today? How is the kids? They ask you pertinent questions, which you think are leading questions, but they're very serious questions. That's why it's important for middle-aged men to do the following. Annual checks to your MOT. We insure our cars, we insure our TVs, we insure our watches, Bupa. GPs, like the wonderful GPs who have on the forum, like Dr. Bello and, and colleagues, make sure every year you go and do your complete tests. You do your post-trait. You know, it doesn't matter what they're putting up your behind. But it tells you playing with your balls. It's irrelevant because it tells you that you're good or if there's something else, just get it sorted out. Check your bowels. Check your cholesterol. Check your heartbeat. Check your, your mental state in the sense that we don't do it. We do it when it's too late. That's why a lot of times you hear that somebody is just left to move to Cameroon for no reason. 
it cannot cope because it's not spoken to anybody. But I'll put it this way to you, which is even more important. As you get older, look for new challenges. Love yourself, you love everybody else. Read more books, travel as much as you can. And when I mean travel, I'm not talking about money. If you cannot travel, there's something called virtual travel. On your laptop, you can go anywhere in the world. You take you to any beautiful streets in the world. You can go to Brazil, sitting in your house in Bissongaban or in Kumba. You can go to New York. You can visit the Colosseum in Italy and go to every single nooks and cranny like you're there physically. It's a 3D. You could go to the Pantheon in Greece. You can go to the Hermitage in Russia. You can go to Stone Age in England. Look for new things. Jazz, blues, soul. We live in an island in the UK, by the way. The sea is very therapeutic. Go to Brighton with a pint and sit by the sea. By the time you leave there, you're healed because it's very spiritual. It's very tranquil. It doesn't judge you. The stone will not talk to you. You can kick the stone. The stone will just look at you. Get involved with the environment. Go walking. Go rambling. And get yourself in touch with nature. You come back feeling better. Exercise. You hear people showing up with all their muscles. It doesn't mean mentally they're right. Do what is fit for you. Go for walks. Go for strolls. Go for logistic, majestic access to the environment. You come back feeling better. But I also say that love is a wonderful thing. A life without love is empty. We can pretend as much as you want. You can't talk to a car. You can't talk to your big house or to your big speakers. You must talk to a partner. You must talk to a spouse. You must talk to a wife. You must talk to somebody. Somebody, you get up in the morning, there's somebody say, have you had coffee? Have you had your tea? It makes a huge difference. You come back from work, there's somebody to ask you, how did your day go for work? The middle-aged African man sometimes forget that. That's the most important thing. He works so hard, but he doesn't enjoy the fruits of his work because he doesn't give his time some time to think. Because as you're growing, your spouse, your wife, your girlfriend, they're getting more dynamic. They're doing yoga. They're doing all kinds of incredible things. Suddenly, your wife is like your daughter. Suddenly, your girlfriend is like your potential girlfriend. And you look at, is it me who has this girlfriend? Mental issues, depression. And the day she leaves you, for somebody like you, but more attractive, more interesting, more engaging, double depression. The day your kids tell you that, daddy, you're so boring. Depression. I brought you up again. It doesn't mean you bring somebody to earth, you're in control of them. So the middle-aged African man, what he eats, if you go to a party and you're given six pieces of meat, that's not love. They're trying to kill you. It has to be fish. It has to be pristine vegetables. No red oil. If they give you a big bottle of achu, oh yeah, it clocks your arteries, my dear brother. It kills you. Take a little bit. Light oil, organic food, light vegetables, a rice, no, 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 fried stuff. <clears throat> Fish, boiled fish, and then your spice is organic. And I have to say this as well. The Asian Indians and Asian Chinese have some wonderful, wonderful herbal medicines, herbal tea, homopathy, all these wonderful things. It's all at the tip. You guys use your phone for Facebook, Instagram. It has amazing information that can actually transform your life for free without even paying for it. So I would say that for the middle-aged man, we have to go with time. We have to ensure that we change. We have to go through that period of transformation. We have to ensure that we're not being influenced, but we're influencing. We have to ensure that we engage on it and we enhance. But last but not the least, you must be selfless. Don't ask your community what they've done for you. Ask, what have I done for my community? So if there's something happening in the community, somebody who doesn't know anybody, he passes away, for example, do your bit to get people to commit because people remember not how much money you have, how you made people feel. What was the reaction when you left the room? What was the reaction when they remember what you did? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 20, whatever. So a lot of my friends here, here, we have contacts that go back 40, 50 years. Important. And depression is not a new thing. I've had depression. When I lost my mom, I was very depressed. I was very down because it was, it was sudden. It was spectacularly sudden. And I was not prepared for it. But what pulled me through was the love of my dear wife, a wife of 22 years, uh, very calm, 
very elegant. Uh, being a doctor, of course, she knows uh, what medically I needed, but just being as a person. And my incredible friends, whose I know that their love for me is profound. And I saw it come to my house at eight in the morning, having driven four or five hours to come and see me, make me laugh the whole day, take pictures, send me warm messages, all kinds of stuff. I don't want to embarrass all the people on the call, but they're very, very special. Sending me spiritual words like from Martin Luther King or from um, uh, Nelson Mandela. That, look, the depression goes. We know that you're most needed. People love you. People are there for you, for you, your spirit, not for anything else. It makes a difference. The middle-aged man, African man, you need to talk more. But last but not the least, when you need a counsel, go see counsel, somebody counsel you. When you need the medical experts, go see them. If your car gets, you go to a mechanic. If you need to buy a house, you go to a lawyer to do the conveyance. If you need to raise a mortgage, you go to the banks. So if you're unwell, you cannot self-diagnose. You go to the experts. And a problem shared is a problem halved. I remember when you go to the doctor, you're already halfway there. I always look at a cup. It should not be 100% full, 10%. 10% of something is better than 100% of nothing. I remember when you go to a doctor, what starts well ends well, always ends well. And without putting, because we I talked about spirituality and I think I was corrected by one of my extreme colleagues there to talk about spirituality, not Christianity, not very, very important. When you're spiritual, it makes a big difference because your spirit never lies. So I'll end by saying that depression can be a phrase of the past if you engage with the right people at the right time. You're never alone. You will never work alone. And people are just a second away from you. Text, WhatsApp, Sky, Teams, Zoom, Facebook, Instagram, you name it. So why would you suffer alone when there's so many people there ready to do anything to make you better than where you were and where you are? So I would say this, this is a wonderful initiative that CAMDOC has started. And I think that in, not only here, I think in Cameroon, even the, the, specifically Cameroon, the problems there are even bigger because they don't have the kind of resources that we have here uh, to be able to see all the various experts. And that's why I think Dr. Ngasa starting with scientifically what it means to be well-being, very, very important we need that. But BK, the life coach, we need that. A life coach to motivate, to engage, to enhance, to be educative, to be informative, to be persuasive, but last but not the least, to inspire you to move from your slumber to where you should be, to meet your potential. And be mindful. Everybody on earth is an angel. Everybody on earth is unique. Everybody on earth is a star. Nobody is better than nobody else. No, 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 no. In terms of the spiritual well. So if you have a problem, please share it. Thank you. Wow, Mr. Ibai, I was spellbound listening to you there. What a fantastic, what a fantastic uh, canter through the, um, the regular approach to mental health, well-being, uh, depression from your, from, your, um, from your prism. And mm -hmm. also in the, uh, in the chat, we are getting messages about um, how people are really clapping. There's one young lady, Princess, who has said that many of our young, uh, of our men need to listen. Now, one question that I'll put to you, and, I, and I'll encourage people in the audience also to put questions in the Q&A box if they want. One quick question I'll put to you. Um, it's quite evident that you are an eloquent, handsome, tall, present, uh, gentlemen, and so you have a lot on your side. However, um, how would you encourage people who don't have as much confidence as yourself to um, tap into these resources that you have so eloquently described? How would you encourage somebody who is more introverted um, to to live his best life in the way that you've described? Uh, Mommy Mo, no, sorry, Dr. Mondio, Morgan. Uh, I get carried away. I think we're in a formal environment, so I must address you accordingly. My apologies. 
But I will say this to you. Humility is the most exquisite form of courtesy. So anytime somebody compliments you about your look, your dress, you compliment back because everybody has unique qualities. Extrovert doesn't make you better than introvert. Introvert doesn't make you better than extrovert. You hear somebody say, me and they talk me over, but that man they talk. No difference. You can be quiet, they still have wonderful qualities. Honesty, integrity, dignity, show, self-discipline. So both attributes are fantastic. But the word about lack of confidence, you have extroverts who do not have confidence. They come across as extroverts, but there's no confidence. Same for introvert. Confidence has to be very, very simple. Whatever happened in the past is in the past. We cannot take care of the past. We can take care of today and tomorrow. Why I say that is that a lot of people have sometimes confidence issues because what happened in the past. Sometimes you're big, you lost weight, you're small, you put weight, or your parents didn't have money, suddenly you have a lot of money now. It's all in the past. So I would say to most people, always focus on your most, your strongest attribute. Don't focus on the weakness because all of us have weaknesses. And if we have to go around the room, the discussion will end because we do have weaknesses for sure. But once you're able to promote, to push the best attributes or skills about your humble self, everybody says it. So that's why sometimes you see short men, very short men, have the most beautiful women. Go and look at people like Ona says, go and look at people like Chirac. I can go on and on. Uh, sorry, my, my laptop is about to go off. Okay. All That's right. good. <laughs> so no, I had to charge it. So, so, so it's just about specifying. Now I put it back on. It's just about specifying on what you need to do. All of us are vulnerable in one way or the other. It's about making sure that vulnerability is a thing of the past, but strength as to something of the future. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to just just on, on, on that point that you've spoken about, that everybody can um, find a way to get out of their difficult, their tight spots, because we all have, have tight spots and we all have weaknesses. Just go back to this think, feel, act cycle that Coach BK was talking about, because this is mm -hmm. a way um, of practically using the resources that we have to get ourselves out of those tight spots, which you have described so beautifully. I'd like to go now to Dr. Ngasa and, um, and field a question which is in our question and answer box. Um, Mr. Ibai spoke about a statistic about the scary um, number of antidepressants that are being sold. Big Pharma is a thing, Big Pharma is a thing. Um, antidepressants and the sensation or the feeling that uh, when you go to your GP and you complain that you're feeling down, all they'll do is just write you a prescription for some SSR, some, some fluoxetine uh, and, and send you off on your way. So this question is, are uh, antidepressants addictive? That's a specific question, but I think that it is based in mm. a concern that people don't, do not want to be medicated for depression. <coughs> So, Dr. Gassa, could you answer that question? Are antidepressants addictive? Um, I think uh, most medication, I almost said every medication, but most medication have the potential to be addictive. Uh, the problem with antidepressant is dependence. So some people actually become dependent on antidepressant, being that even when they don't have uh, symptoms of depression, they still need the antidepressant to see as if something is working for them. Mm -hmm. But you can't compare that additive potential of antidepressants to things like uh, cocaine or drugs, alcohol, and things like that. So it's less addictive compared to uh, the other illicit medications that we know of. Fantastic, excellent. Because of the way the, 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 the molecule actually works, it doesn't train your brain to say that if you don't have it, then you can't function. So that's what an addiction is. An addiction is that you need that particular thing in order to function. 
So um, thank you, Mrs. Nafti, Dr. Nafti, who has given, said that the talk was very holistic and motivating our men about being intentional uh, in making the right changes in the pillars of lifestyle, uh, etc. Thank you very much for that comment, because in fact, that's what it was. Um, Mr. Ebai's talk was fantastic. Thank you. Now, this question goes to you, Mr. Ebai, from, uh, again, an anonymous, anonymous attendee. What one single thing helped you get over your depression when you lost your mum? Can you crystallize it to one particular, just one thing? Tabby? Sorry, was that a question? Yes, that was a question. The question was aimed at yourself um, and it comes from an anonymous attendee and it says, what, what one particular thing helps you to get over your depression when you lost your beautiful mom? Um, I think everybody who loses a mom or dad goes through all kinds of ants. But I will say this for me specifically, uh, when my mom, my mom passed, I was not in a good shape physically, mentally. Uh, and, and the biggest thing for me was my two sons, my first son who was 35, Louis, and my last son, who was seven, saying, Daddy, I couldn't get up from bed. I couldn't sleep. And if I slept, I overslept. I didn't eat. I couldn't work. couldn't do anything. And when my last son and my first son came to bed, I said, Dad, you can't go on like this. Uh, we need you as well. When my daughter, who was 17 in uh, July, said the same thing, but last but not the least, uh, it was very profound for my wife to say, you can't leave me a, a young widow with two kids when you have so much going for you. Your mom has done a wonderful thing. She died at 76. Uh, you are 52 at the time. And it doesn't make sense for you to wallow in self-pity. It's selfish. Uh, you're head of your immediate sibling. Uh, you are an, an administrator for a big estate in Cameroon. You have responsibilities here. And then, of course, uh, I joined the, uh, this is specific, this is personal. It's not for everybody. And I'm not, I'm not recommending it to everybody. But I did join a prayer group. And I spent a lot of time just going through the Bible, spiritual words, reading the, reading the biographies of great men who've suffered incredible loss and how they coped with it. And I think after a year, what even cemented it was some of my very, very close friends who I've known for over 40 years, their messages, their texts, their calls, the support. It was just incredible. I can, I can, what can I express it? So when somebody happens in the community, the guys see me running around, I can never give back what my friends have given to me, never, to the day I die. So when uh, when somebody you the 50 pounds or 100 pounds. An example, when I got to 55, 55 years old, the day my friends did a surprise 55 for me, my mother-in-law had passed that day. But they gave me a check for $10,000 with cards and everything. It doesn't happen. $10,000 lying in your house, your friends surprise you, you come, and your wife, that day, of course, my mother-in-law just died. It tells you that we have some unique, they didn't have any reason to do it. They did it because they love you. So what's there not to live for? Beautiful wife, beautiful kids, some amazing friends. I just have to go back and say, you're so selfish. Because depression makes you selfish. You're thinking only about yourself. You're thinking about all of your needs. You think about nobody else. You don't even care about anybody else. It's like being addicted like to cocaine or alcohol, where it's only about you. So it's been a, yeah, personally, the last three years, I think it's actually made me a better person to go through the kind of pain and absence of despair, dissolution, disenchantment, uh, and uh, but the people who have worse. They don't have a job, they don't have a kid, they don't have a, So please. So I think it's all personal. Uh, and I think yeah. BK, who's a life coach, I think Holy the question sense. actually was was specifically to yourself. What yeah. what it was the thing that brought and and you 
you really uh, comprehensively answered that question. Um, yeah. And I, in that question, in that answer, I've seen that there was some tough love, there was some um, uh, discomfort that you had to go through in order to grow, and that that growth has made you a better person. If you don't mind, I'll move on very, very quickly and connect, connect uh, two questions um, uh, from, from our anonymous attendee again and address these to Coach BK. Do you have many Black people coming to you for help? And what sort of help do you offer? And um, are there any specific talking therapies aimed at Black people that um, might be... Uh, um answered by um dr bello but we shall see if you can have a pop at those uh, questions and just to say that we are rounding up i know that we did have a few technical problems so i've just added on a few minutes onto the end of our webinar but we will, should be coming to the to to bring this plane into landing soon so coach bk Yes, so um, do you have the questions highlighted? Is it possible to bring them on screen? So no, it was really, um, do you have any, uh, do, you, how, do you get a lot of black people come to you to, to, for your services? And are there any specific talking therapy and what sort of help do you offer? Okay, so it's another good question. Amazingly, young men are really beginning to embrace talking therapy, so to speak. I'm pleasantly surprised. But I get a lot more women, especially in relationships, which are going south. And <clears throat> in terms of any specific therapies for men, it's amazing when we remove all the labels and we embrace the situation, we realize that therapy is not about identifying a particular problem and fixing it. It's about engaging in conversation. And when you engage in a soul-searching conversation, and the principles I, I have deployed so far seem to work across the board. There may be little nuances depending on each person's journey and what it is they are suffering from at any particular point in time. What do I mean by this? Usually, the presenting symptom is just that. It is a symptom. There is a deeper underlying root cause. So if you go fighting the symptom, you're really chasing your own tail. But if you get into a conversation, when you make someone realize that, when they get to the door, they drop who they think they are or were. Leave your titles behind because they a lot, a lot of the time, I realize that people define themselves by who they know their titles, who they, what they own, and all of that. And it is extremely ephemeral. Now, you can't define yourself by something that you orchestrated, that you manifested, because if you manifested it, then you are bigger than it. You are better than it. The moment you define by yourself by it, you shrink and you limit yourself. And so you stop going in areas where you could be of potential benefit, and that is how that cycle starts. Who am I to do or to try? this. Yes. And when you engage, exchange these energies and build synergies, people connect in an environment, because it's about creating an environment like a soil, which is fertile. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, any plant will grow. It doesn't need mm -hmm. added attention. So just create an environment which is conducive for growth. Exchange energies, build synergies. Three simple operating principles. I just want to divert, yes, I just want to divert a bit to say that um, I don't want to lose that Train of thought. Okay, I'll come back to it. So um, mm. it's three simple principles and they work across the board. Okay. Unconditional, so, yeah, mom, it's, it's, it's important. So there's unconditional love. There's that ability to talk about sacred things, you know, because taboo is a problem for most people. And I always say that what you consider or conceive of as a taboo, that is the place where your gremlins and your demons go to seek refuge because they will be safe there. It's, a, it's an area you do not touch. Mm -hmm. But once you, quote unquote, untabulize these things, then you can talk about them freely. And at mm -hmm. some point, you realize that you've resolved issues you did not even realize you had just by really connecting. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And of course, challenging for mutual growth. But it's about creating that environment. The only difference between men and women comes back to the hormones. You've got more estrogen. Women, are, they, they're more well, estrogen, oxytocin, and all. They are more nurturing. So their needs will be different. They want to nurture. They want to take care of their home. They want to, they want to be the best thing to their, to their spouses. Whereas men, you've got all this testosterone, and it's all about power and control for the most part and respect. So once you understand the play of the underlying chemicals and the neurology and then the thinking, and you see where someone is going and how they are coping with the challenges that they face. Because we all have coping mechanisms and we create. And I'll, I'll just conclude by saying, a lot of the time, we create what Anthony Robbins, an amazing coach, refers to as safe problems. So you've got this thing here that you can actually deal with and it will help you grow and become better. But you create this other problem on this other side. It is so big, you're trying to save the world. You can't fail doing it because everyone can see you're trying. And that's where we spend a lot of time. And then we go on to drugs to cope. So how do we cope? Let's look for better ways of coping and it will beat depression. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a really comprehensive answer to the question. Um, the, there was another question about um, talking therapies aimed mainly at Black people, and Dr. Bello has very kindly put in the chat a uh, uh, link to the Caribbean African Health Network who offer counselling. And we, CAMDOC UK, are working very closely with them. And um, we actually had one of our psychiatry consultants do a talk on, um, on uh, mental health problems for the Caribbean African uh, Network health network. Now we have Dr. Nafti who has put a question in the in the um, Q&A box about um, any advice regarding social media screen time and the impact on mental health. Does any one of our um, of our panelists possibly Mr. Ibai do you want to pick that up about social media and screen time and what how it affects your mental health? He's unmute. Uh, sorry, yes, unmute yourself. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I'll put it, I think that was a, a great question from Dr. Phyllis uh, Nafti. Put it this way, mental health is also about perception. We use our laptop for work, for Zoom, for Teams. Everybody's now on their laptop professionally. We're actually working from home. So social media, if you use it sensibly, I don't think it should be a problem. The problem becomes when you become addicted to it and you're not using it for any constructive purpose. It's just opening it for the sake of opening. So I think that we can manage why, for example, if you don't have a positive uh, message to share on social media that's going to impact people in the right way, why share? If you're sharing information that is educative, it's persuasive, it's informative, it's today, it's important. Of course you should share. But if you have a private uh, squabble with somebody which has no interest to the public, why share? Same for kids. Your kids should be uh, on, and that's something I as a dad have to work on to reduce the number, the time your kids spend on uh, playing games, for example. With social media as well, what sites are they accessing? Yeah. What are the parental guidance? You should yeah. also have your laptop with, they cannot watch anything which does not pass the parental test. So yeah. anything they're accessing, we can see it on our own devices. Just like when your kids go around, you can track where they're going on your iPad, on your iPhone. Same. You track what they're doing, what they're looking, and you can jump in so this, at the very early end. Yeah. The, sorry, to, so, sorry to interrupt there, but this no, actually good. Is, is a fantastic segue into our next question, which comes from the Chinjays um, over in Wales and what they are asking. And I'd like Dr. possibly Dr. Ngasa to pick this one. As parents navigating the world of our kids, are there actually any telltale signs for the onset of mental illness? We do find that a lot of children are presenting with um, mental health issues and um, our child and adolescent mental health system uh, is, is crumbling under the weight of the requirement for their, their uh, services. Are you able to give some insight into this? Um, I think my experience uh, 
working in the camp service for six months was that we have a lot of children coming in with uh, conditions like autism and at attention deficit adaptive disorders. So which are quite common in children after the age of five years. Now, it's a combination of things that can lead to this combination. Most of them, the first thing is genetics. Children who are born in homes where you have a ch child who already has this condition, they are more likely to suffer from either autism or uh, ADHD. We also have children who go through difficult uh, prenatal and postnatal uh, uh, conditions. So if you have a, a mom that had a difficult pregnancy, uh, maybe there was some kind of uh, brain injury to the child when they were very young, it, they are more likely to suffer from, from this condition. Okay. Uh, it was believed at one time that, uh, I mean, it was, was all over the media, which was a wrong perception that children will receive uh, vac some, some vaccines at the early age are more likely to develop autism. I think that's a wrong concept. And that has actually made many parents to not vaccinate their children because they think they might develop these conditions. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thank you so much. Thank you. I think that actually opens up a whole new um, field that we probably need to look into as a separate matter um, the matter of uh, the, the, our mental the mental state of our children however um, for this series we're talking about men's mental health yeah. uh, and uh, as I said at the beginning it's the first of a lot of uh, different webinars the first of a series of our guy looking after our guys because you are important to us you mean a lot to us and as just as a conclusion i will um read the the question which um dr jumisi has put in the q a box and i think it is more of a rhetorical question and it has re resonates with themes that have been brought through by all of our three speakers and she says, how many people in our community are ready to support others without being judgmental? How many people are ready to support others without finding them needy or diminished? Uh, could it be that is one of the reasons that Black men are reluctant to seek help? Could it be that that is the reason why Black men are um, reluctant to show themselves as vulnerable. So um, from just with this point, I don't think we will be able to answer that question. I'd like to leave this with you and um, ask you to reflect on this. And remember, each person's health depends on all of us. We are a community. CAMDOC is here for you. We will have this webinar on our YouTube, YouTube channel for you to go back to. We do um, have uh, further, um, we, we do have further webinars planned for in our series of men's health. We're going to be talking about a big topic prostate and um, testicular cancer, as well as things that people don't generally like to talk about, erectile dysfunction and how things start to go when we get to the position where we're not as strong as we used to be, using rather uh, euphemistic terms. But on that note, I'd like to invite Dr. Valingua who is our educational secretary to conclude and um, and then we can say take take our leave. Doc, Dr. Valingua. Is Dr. Ngua there? Yes, here we are. Yeah. I, uh... Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks to all our panelists for a, a very um, 
brilliant uh, conversation. I've been following on the chat, and there've been uh, lots of brilliant questions as well. Uh, we continue the conversations on um, on men's health, and and um, as we said the last time, aging in particular, as we get older, what the health challenges are. As uh, Dr. Moncho has said, we've got a few uh, talks lined up. So we're hoping that uh, you will all join up in these uh, conversations as we tend to navigate this difficult terrain. But I'm so happy that we're getting a good response from our community on this. So see you at the AGM where we're gonna have more uh, conversations on this. Um, and thank you so much for attending. Thank you. Thank you very much. On behalf of Dr. Bello, our chairperson, we thank you very, very much for attending and for spending your Saturday evening with us. It has been an immense pleasure. Goodbye. Bye, thank you very much. Thank you. Could I ask the panelists just to, to hold on for a bit? Don't, don't go off just for a short, short while. So we do a debrief while our attendees leave. <laughs> Just, just give us two, two 